Welcome back to the Dynasty Dingers podcast. It is Monday, March 11th. This is episode two. I am your host, Matt, joined as always by my very famous co-host, Doc. Doc, what is going on, brother? Yeah, man. I mean, I'm pretty famous. I, you know, the, the phrasing of always, I'm always your host. I mean, this is the second time, dude. We got to set the, the groundwork, I'm not, you know? I'm not that reliable yet. This is this kid's <laughs> fall apart in a second. This is, you know, we actually had video for the first one. We yeah. lost it because I didn't. Yeah, it was my fault. So anyway, we're, 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 this is a redemption round here, baby. Well, I'm and excited. I think from an analytical perspective, you know, you're batting a thousand now. So that is, if we're talking consistency, uh, that's Hall of Fame status, right? That's the greatest of all time. So we're on the right track here. But we have a great episode for you today. We're going to be breaking down some of the scout the stat line. Uh, grades as well as comparison for players and comps we're gonna be looking over some spring store uh, spring training storylines a couple really fun players to monitor going into the season as well as just some really big breakouts that we're seeing some profile changes and then overall just general conversation uh, regarding some of the storylines that is going on in spring training as well so a lot to get into today but doc kind of want to just talk about quickly what's going on within our world uh, you know, re- last week we referenced the top 100 and had a conversation based off both of our top 100s. You're still trending pretty well on Twitter. You have released your full model. And then this week you actually released a, a small snippet for each player, kind of your take and your projection off those players. Tell us a little bit about how you went about that article and uh, if the listener wants to check it out, what they should be looking for. Yeah, I mean, I got my top 100 ranks on the Twitter pins, that's just the whole ranks. If you want to see them straight up, they're doing well. We've got almost 160,000 views on that, man. That is so funny. It's like, I imagine all those people in an arena or something. It's like, great, great, love it. <laughs> and uh, but you know, it's funny. We actually we have the we have the bigger the bigger slice of the cake here, though. We got my analysis. I went 14 Google Doc pages deep for this. I didn't think I was gonna do it. I thought I was gonna do. You know, some big blurs for the big boys and then just kind of do a tier thing like, you know, 40 to 50, 50. To, I couldn't help myself. I was up till whatever in the morning and I had some fun with it. So, yeah, my nice, big, juicy write up on all top 100 prospects. You can find that on scoutthestatline.com. Uh, that's probably your best bet at this point. It's a free article. What do you think out of that top 100? And I know I'm, I'm putting you on the spot here, but I, I think anytime the creative juices get flowing, there are certain players that you hit on where when you look at the end document, you're like, darn, I really, <clears throat> I went kind of crazy with that player. Which one's got you the most excited just off the top of your head? And, and you know, do you think you feel even a little bit differently about those players now that you've written a little more in depth about them? Well, it's also time has passed. Like literally yep. we are such, we are such losers, you know, at least I am. I mean, I, I think so many of us even, you know, quote experts or whatever we are or whatever we pretend to be, it's, our, our opinions shift more than we think, or our, our, our opinions want to shift. There's like some little voice in us saying, no, 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 he did three homers in one week. Now he's amazing, you know, forget about all of last year and all the data we have. So it's like, that's kind of a funny thing. I've resisted moving anyone around, but I'll give you a good guy and a bad guy in terms of, you know, how I'm feeling on their ranks right now. So what I'm feeling really good about, what I'm feeling really good about was because today someone said, I saw a tweet saying, oh, the highest I've seen Kobe Mayo ranks before spring training was, I think it was 12th or 13th. And I said, no, I had him at seven. So feeling really good. And it's funny, I tweeted about that. I'm like, dude, what? he's getting not as much hype as you would have thought. Because, because dude, these guys, it's whatever home run goes viral on Twitter. If your home run was not televised, it didn't happen for, for spring training hype. <laughs> and so that funny. And then I tweeted about it and it went like big. And then five seconds later, he actually hit because he had hit a big double. And then five seconds later, he launched a, a big, huge home run on TV, a monster. So that was just instant you know, vindication. Love that. Um, and then Victor Scott, it's just Victor Scott. You know, I feel like nobody cares. I have him at 18. They're like, oh, he's probably 18. Frig, we should have done it first. Um, and then the bad one, the bad my, my worst rank is james wood maybe maybe not he's still a top 50 prospect for me but 48 is by far the lowest uh and that was before spring people are like how could you have him there i'm like dude did you look at double a numbers from last year i don't know did he make that big of a transformation you know from now from you know is he is, is he a new player now is he the spring guy probably not he's probably not going to put that forward he's probably not going to start people are like yeah of course he's going to start opening day i'm like no he's, he's not i'll bet you money he's not um he'd have to keep this up but at a really insane rate 
anyway, that would be my my guy who, uh, yeah, I'm not shifting him up to the top 10 yet, but it's like, okay, maybe he's closer to Spencer Jones at 30. Maybe I was a little harsh. Yeah, and I think I think this is the beauty of the top 100 that we each personally have is, you know, we all have different variable rates in which we are, are viewing players. You know, you looking at Wood, it's very reasonable to have him kind of floating around that top 50, especially with that 35% K-rated double A. For me, I'm I'm very aggressive. I look for profiles that can change my, my uh, fantasy dynasty rosters, and I'm willing to be wrong, 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 because if I'm right, I know I'm getting a really impact player. So I will I will rank more aggressively. Now, we don't know the questions regarding Ellie De La Cruz's K-rate coming into this season. James Wood follows a very similar trajectory where it's like these guys could be just middle of the pack redraft guys in a few years and see that star status wear off. Sure, they could also turn into top 10 players, but Mm -hmm. there are huge question marks concerning both profiles. Now, when you look at Kobe Mayo, we love almost everything about the profile, and I I do think he aligns with the top 10 ranking. Last thing I'll add is I, I think from the recency relevance here, just looking at Kobe Mayo and um, and Colt Keith last year, you see the differences in the the rankings right now based off. We got really excited about what Colt was doing upon the promotion in the end of season where he was jumping at times Kobe. Now Kobe has a good spring and people are really starting to view the profile a little differently, these two, and really starting to project Kobe as more of the, the long-term holdable player. I think timing is so key in all of this, and I, I follow the same issue in regards to when I do my list, even if I look back three days later, I want to move mm-hmm. a lot of players around. And you've mm-hmm. got to fight that off because in the moment you rank them for a reason. And I'm really excited to see your next release of your top 100 and see some of the changes that you have made because we'll have a little bit more data. We'll have the season have started. And at that point, we could start to see really some of these pieces that you have either aggressively ranked high or aggressively ranked in the middle start to really take uh, hold and form. And then that's a deeper conversation we can have. Yeah, and it's going to be so fun to see all the FYPD guys, uh, you know, putting forward a full season because they're tired at the end of the yeah. at the end of the long year, whether it's high school or college. And so, and the whole off season, especially the whole, uh, you know, I was going to say just especially the high school kids, but both of them, they're going to, they're in the major league organizations for, for, for the first time over a whole off season. It's exciting to see what they're going to put together. I think I know your answer to this, but who are you most excited out of FYPD to really track for the first month, either in, either in the minor leagues? Max or Clark. Maybe- Max Clark, yeah. What are you looking to see at him? Yeah, so Max Clark, I, I put him number one just because, I mean, they're saying he put on more muscle. He was already 6'1", 190. They like, say he put on more weight. I'm like, what does that mean? Because he's got 70-grade speed. So, like, it doesn't really matter. I'm not scared. I'm not worried about him getting too beefed up. You can only go so far from 70-grade speed. So what I'm looking for is – uh, you know, this teenager to come out here and show us his great approach. Because I'm kind of banking on that. If you've got the great hit tool that I think he does, the great approach, like I think he does, um, then his speed will play. He'll be on base to steal bases. And I'm really looking forward to seeing, dude, I saw some videos of this kid swinging a bat. That's crazy bat speed. Don't tell me he doesn't have power or he can't tap into it one day. He can. The question is how, how much or how much he wants to. Maybe he's happy being a <laughs> really terrible outcome, Freddie Freeman type, right? Where he's like, you know, maybe low twenties, high teens power, but he's like crushing everything else, and and also giving you, I don't know, up to fifty stolen bases. That's that's the kind of player like that I'm looking for from Max Clark. So, yeah, when I'm gonna when I rank him aggressively like that, eighth, um, no one's got him that high. I don't think I had him number three in the FYPD. So yeah, Max Clark, I think has to be the guy I'm gonna be looking at. And then Brock Wilkins, another name that you absolutely love. I know you're excited to, to see him get out of the gate fast. Are you keeping an eye on any of his metrics in particular? Are you just looking to see that power really leveraged? So I keep asking people, I say, well, what's your, what's your concern? Because I'm, I'm, why am I the weird guy? Why am I the guy who has Brock Wilkins so high and people don't have him on their top 100? And they say, oh, you know, well, we're kind of we're not sure how he's going to do against curveballs uh, and how he's going to handle, you know, off-speed pitching, double A, and maybe it's a fair point. I'm, you know, you'd think at a high level college, you know, he saw some some decent pitches, but of course, Double A is it is what I look for. It is what a lot of people look for. Uh, you're just seeing things that you never saw before. Uh, that said, 
I'm trying to look up his spring. Yeah, so his spring training, he got some more at bats in, unfortunately, just because I say unfortunately, he had a 714 batting average for a second there with <laughs> like six at bats. Yeah, it was ridiculous. It was, it was great. He's still great. It's so funny, you know. Um, you know, he's he's only at a 417 average, 563 OBP, 1.146 OPS uh, in spring training against you know mix of major league and high minor league talent in spring training. So I'm not really. I'm not really freaked out over here. I am excited to see how he does at double A AA and triple A, but it's kind of funny. So I don't, just real quick on Wilkin, he was lighting up, you know, the lower levels and they threw him in double A at the very end, which is crazy. It's great. It shows that they're being very aggressive with him, being very aggressive with, with Wilkin. And his first at bat, I think it was, it was his first game in double A, he hit a grand slam. So I'm like, Dude, let's just have fun here. I, I hope he kills it. It'll be great to see. Yeah, and, and I think he's going to be a name that we track because this past FYPD draft, I, I truly think is going to go down in the record books as one of the best we've seen in a long time. And I know someone on Twitter this week had reached out to you and said they got him in the second round. And I, my first thought was, well, I wish I was in that league mm-hmm. um, because you know you and I are high on him. You have been the highest that I know of on Wilkin as well as Clark. <clears throat> and then you have you know the last name that I just want to touch on before we break into our first storyline of the day, which is uh, Cold Emerson. You know, coming into camp, added some weight himself. Unbelievable uh, bat-to-ball contact skills last year. We're projecting him, I think, to be one of the best players in this class. Are you excited to see him start this 2024 season? And what do you think of the added weight? I mean, what what, what do you have to say? Like, So it's a small sample size, obviously. We don't yeah. have to go over, head over heels to... We don't have to, it's not too hard to imagine that, but your 17 year old, he had, he's listed at, on BR, 17 year old. But how old is he now? So he's, yeah, he's 18 right now. That means, yeah, during last season, he was 17. And, and you know, he's, he's just obliterating A ball, uh, coming straight out of a high school season, you know, 302 BA, 436 OBP. Uh, and that was, and oh my gosh, like, I, yeah, his rookie ball, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. It's a video game number, 536 BA. 6229 OBP. So small, small sample size or not, this is a kid who didn't back down when he got thrust into the limelight, right? And so, yeah, man, I'm excited to see what he brings to the table. Colt Emerson, that's a trio right there. I guess I got a question for you coming back at you. Maybe yeah. you got something else to say on Colt Emerson, but my question to you and to myself and to the world at large would be, who's the bust? Because there has to be a bust, right? Like I, you know, I hope the, I hope the best for these guys, but who's, who's the guy? I mean, this top 10... And more, I mean, I see a drop off in the teens a little bit. It's more believable. But this top 10, I'm like, gosh, statistically speaking, like at least one of you is going to bust. Probably more are just well, going to be mid. So <clears throat> I, cl- I classify bust in, in all regards. And this is out of respect to the players. We, I've defined yes. this on other shows. To me, a bust is a player that does not return value on their ADP. I don't care if that's redraft leagues, dynasty mm-hmm. startups, FYPD. I follow the same concept all the way through, right? And I'm going to tell you a name and it's going to break my heart because I don't want it to happen. I have a lot of shares of him. I have him as my number one pitcher in my my rankings. I think Paul Skeens is probably the most no. likely to bust no. because I have him as potential Hall of Fame talent. And there is I mean to to meet that criteria you're, you're almost out of the gate preparing someone to fail. Okay. So I think we could see a couple all-star games at his absolute floor. I think we could see a player that, you know, follows in line with not necessarily a Garrett Cole career, but maybe a similar arc in regards to having a couple really nice seasons. But my only concern is because he's a pitcher, health always comes into the equation. And when he leverages that 100 mile an hour fastball, you have to hope that he can stay healthy because he's going to need that to dominate Major League Baseball. And if we drop down to a 94, 95, maybe post-injury, he's going to have to learn how to be a different pitcher. So mm. I think it's probably Skeens. And then maybe the second name I have, oh, I hate to say it too because you just hyped him up, would be would just be Clark, um, mm. just, just because he's so young. Clark and Jenkins, you know, we're projecting these guys to be unbelievable, but they're high schoolers. And I think when you have the high school names, there's always a risk as opposed to Cruz and Langford who – they did it at the highest level of college. I have a little more certainty they'll be major league starters at the absolute least. Um, you know, and then we're projecting them so much farther. But <clears throat> I think Skeens and Clark have have me concerned, but I also have a lot of shares and I'm very excited about both. 
Yeah, what it's is, a tough question. What is your thought in that same vein? It's just so hard to figure it out. I agree with you with the high school thing, but you can flip it around and you can yep. say, uh, you could say, well, if they if they're showing signs of struggle at, at 18, 19, 20, you know, you have like, you know, five years before it's getting to like, okay, yeah, he's just not going to make it. And that could be like within those five years, you can fall out of fantasy favor, but you're not going to be out of the system. Like you'll have chances to, to tap into that because it's like a really crazy post hype guy. I mean, uh, with the college guys, if they take two to three years to kind of figure it out, you get into this 25, 26, 27 year old range where like, is it, you know, it's it, the question of, is it ever going to happen comes a lot sooner. And so I, I just don't know what to think. It's easy to say that the pitchers, right? Uh, you know, wall drip, crazy control, Myers, like skinny, you know, skinny kid. I, I love, I love these guys for different reasons. Um, the, but yeah, I mean, I think I still think I think because we're having a hard time with this. I don't think it's just recency bias. I do think that this is going to go down as one of the greatest draft classes in a long time. So yeah, that's that's kind of a cop out answer, huh? But, no, it's not. Be, yeah. But because I don't I don't remember the last time we've seen a top six, I would say top five so deep, right? Wyatt Langford, Yamamoto, Paul Skeens, Dylan Cruz, Max Clark, Walker Jenkins, six top six. We are we are looking at all six of these guys as say next year, the year after they could have gone number one, right? And I think when I've looked at a, a couple past FYPDs, you've had one or two players that never even made like make the major leagues. Mm-hmm. Um, guys that we had question marks coming out of college, like you just said, where they hit the first minor league level at twenty three into their twenty four age season, and it's like, hey, you guys need to produce right off the bat yeah. and fast because if you don't, like you're gonna stall out at double A. And we've seen that. We've seen that from SEC guys. And this class was just so special. And I wanted you to talk about Cold Emerson because um, you hit it right on the head, the point that I was trying to dig out of you. We get really, really, really excited about DSL and FCL guys, complex league rookie ball. I do. I'm, I'm a huge proponent of like looking at those numbers and, and hyping these guys up because they should be excited players and, and talked about. But when you have a guy like Cole Emerson come out of high school, go into the same rookie league and absolutely dominate, it's a very good reminder that the level of competition these guys are playing at for 40, 50 games is a lot lower as you see Colt go on to A ball and continue to dominate, right? We're looking for these guys to come out of complex and answer some questions as they hit A ball. Well, Emerson coming into 18 year old season in 2024 has already done that. So I think he's a great reminder that we need to pump the brakes sometimes on some of the excitement for rookie complex leagues and and just watch that development play out. Um, Lastly, I I looked back at DSL MVPs. Kevin Hidalgo is a a really, really big favorite of mine right now out of the Rockies organization. He won DSL MVP for 2023. The last six DSL MVPs are guys you would absolutely not recognize on paper. Mm -hmm. So something to note as Emerson, as you had mentioned, dominated. Um, I think he's probably the, the, my favorite pick in the first round because he fell outside of that top six and he could be, he could be one of the best in the entire class. And we haven't even mentioned Wilkin, right. Who's behind Emerson for (laughs) some people. Uh, I know not necessarily for you, but it's close. It's It's close. close. Yeah. Um, all right. So we, we got into a a segment that we didn't have on paper. I kind of love that. It's uh, it's time for us to go into our segment one for the day doc. We're going to talk a little bit about the scout, the stat line peak projections, a couple of players that we both like and the comps that ultimately scout the stat line has attached to them by the algorithm. You have three really nice names here uh, and we're kind of projecting going into 2024 here names to follow. So why don't you give us our, your three names and just talk a little bit about each player? Yeah. So first player, Jace Young. I mean, if you look at his profile, the numbers he's putting up, and just his build and his name, <laughs> it reminds me of that one guy. Oh yeah, Josh Young, his brother down in Texas. We're accepting Josh Young as his premier third base fantasy option. Kind of getting a little concerned with his injuries so far. It's like, okay, let's get a little healthier. But anyway, other than that, you know, we're looking at a kid who who looks like he's profiling the same way. He's, he's getting moved over to third base. Is it because he's in Detroit? Maybe I don't know. But I have him at forty nine. It's like that needs to be higher. I think if I think I think he can be Josh Young. Is what I'm trying to say. I think he can be Josh Young. And from what I can tell from the numbers, from some scout suggestions, he actually might have higher on base percentage upside. Really fun, fun, weird kind of comp. The, the uh, scout the stat line has for him. It's just our 
our projection algorithms. They, they say Mitch Garver, and they say 27 home runs at his peak with 321 OBP. I think Mitch Garver has done a 370. You know, he's gone higher in small sample sizes. But, yeah, no, I, I don't think it's completely off. Um, and I think that Mitch Garver, other than the catcher part of it, I think that's kind of an interesting thing. I think we're looking at a 25 to 30 home run kind of guy, 322. Yeah, can he be more than the Josh Young? I think Josh Young's right now his OVP, you're looking at a 320 to 340 kind of thing, uh, maybe a higher average. But, yeah, I mean, this is someone who I think we need to be more excited about because I feel like there's a nice floor as a power corner bat. Yeah, and I think when we're talking about this Tigers lineup, um, Cole Heath, Spencer Torkelson, Riley Green, we're talking about young coming up uh with the name we just mentioned right max, max clark. clark yeah this is in three years we're going to be talking about a very very exciting team i'm on board i am too um i mean this is going to be one of the best young cores in the league right cincinnati baltimore detroit seattle we have some seattle names on this list one that you're going to talk about for us but you're talking about a team that's going to put up runs a team that's going to steal bases a team that's going to fl- play very old school baseball mixed in with a guy like Torkelson, who's going to hopefully continue to tap into that power as the first overall pick from a couple of years ago. I think Young is an awesome, um, it's an awesome buying time for Young as well, because we have so many of these other prospects we're really excited about. And again, a reminder, when we're talking about top 100s, we're looking for these guys to come up and provide value and be starters. I would absolutely be thrilled with a Mitch Garver comp. If we can see Young at his prime be Mitch Garver, that's a very useful player with good power in a great lineup. So I'm really happy you, you toss Young in. Your next name is actually a similar profile, different organization, less power, but very different number one skill set with the stolen bases in 2023. And I like the comp. Who's the next name on your list? Okay, I'm going to push back on it a lot of what you just said. Please. I don't think they're similar at all. Um, but they, this is Tyler Black. This is Tyler Black. Here on this show, we don't, we don't suck up to each other. We... We like to agree, yeah, but we Yeah, that also... was garbage, wasn't it? Tyler yeah. Black is uh, is never going to hit you pro- 20 home runs. So kudos uh, for that time. He could. That, that's what that's that's the X factor. So what we're looking at with, with, with Tyler Black is like an, a potential 400 OBP upside. He's been doing it this whole minor league career so far. Uh, and he's going to – it's kind of almost a new thing. He seems to have that, you know, natural speed. But we're starting to see him use that. Uh, Tyler Black with his steals coming into a, a crazy new world. And that's just a fun, it's a fun blend, right? Because I feel like a lot of the time these guys they slap, they slap the ball. The guys who steal tons of bases, right? They're out, they're usually in a BA or an OBP liability. And so what we're seeing here is someone who just is like it's OBP first actually, and then stolen bases are really good. And he's starting to show some really fun pop. Uh, his big question, the Tyler Black question, is, is defense, which is his, so his comp with stat, scout the stat line. I don't necessarily. You know, I don't know if it's – so 331 OBP. Projections are always low. They're almost always low unless they're – I feel like when you're a lower level uh, – when you're at the lower levels and you're just crushing it like Cole Emerson was, you know, the projections will have fun with that. But they're usually a little bit more harsh at the higher levels, which is fair because baseball is hard. But, yeah, 331 OBP, which for projections is actually pretty good. 10 home runs, 23 stolen bases. Might be a 10 home run guy, but I think we're seeing 30 plus. I, th- I see 30 plus. And Coco Crisp is the comp. So, Coco Crisp, it's such a fun name. I'm just going to keep saying Coco Crisp. He had a career high of 49 stolen bases. So, that is the upside for Tyler Black, in my opinion. And he and Chris Crisp also had 22 home runs one year. So, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting, fun comp. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for Tyler Black. He needs to find a defensive home. That's his big. That's his big concern. Yeah, defensive home is key, and and you're right. Black is really going to leverage the old school baseball approach of patience. You know, um, eye at the plate, and I think you're right with the X factor. I think uh, Jace's ability to hit the ball, hit the ball with authority, produce the home runs, probably aren't in question at the major league level. It's going to be more of the average, and, and it's going to be how the other skill set plays out. Where it's almost the opposite with Black, like you had said, right? Where Black is doing everything else that you want to see out of your profiles properly, but the X factor will be, especially in fantasy lineups, that power. If he can hit you 20 home runs and get you 30 stolen bases every season while that OBP sits around 360, 370, if that's even possible, I mean, that's extreme peak. Even like, what, a top SPS. three rounder. I'm sorry, a yeah. top, top, top three round draft pick in a redraft. Yeah, absolutely. So 
you know, if you're looking at like maybe both of our peak projections for, for young and black, who would you rather draft in a, in a dynasty league knowing that, you know, they're providing you X amount of value for that spot? I, I think I, I play in a lot of OBP leagues. Okay. And it's weird because like steals are becoming more common, but it's also like you need to have them to keep up, you know, because there's so many of them now, so many more stolen bases. So, you know, I just, I'd like to have them both, but if I had to pick one, I would go with Tyler Black, actually. Yeah. And he's a scout the stat line darling. Like they, They've been on him for a while. The industry is slowly catching up to that. Yeah. No, I'm in agreement with you. Um, I like both of them. I'm happy with both of them on my bench for either a corner spot or if one of them ends up settling at second base, which I think at this point, Young is probably out on second base with the uh, Arizona Fall League reps at third, as you had kind of mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, but Black, again, is in, a, in an organization where you have Brock Wilkin coming up. Right, Milwaukee's kind of searching. Is, is Joey Ortiz going to be the shortstop of the future th- plus defender? Bryce Terrain kind of kicking around at second base, doesn't really have the bat, but can Black take that job is really the question. And I think once he gets the opportunity at the major league level, he's going to be a really big aspect of, of the Brewers organization being successful offensively because he should be setting the table for Brock Wilkin, for Jackson Churio. And when you have those three names in the lineup, if they can produce the way we think they can, this is going to be also another team of core players that we can add to the Detroit, Seattle, mm-hmm. Baltimore, Cincinnati group where we're going to watch these guys put up really nice numbers. The, in a hitter's uh, the, park. In a, in a hitter's yeah, park. It's worth in a hitter's park. Um, also known, I will always call it Miller Park. Uh, I know a number mm-hmm. of us in the industry will, will die on that hill. But uh, your next name is one of my favorites in the industry. I think it's one of the most dangerous in the industries uh, because we, we haven't seen enough at high levels, but there's an incredible comp on him. So why don't you go ahead and give, <laughs> us, give us our third name here? It's exactly what I foreshadowed with this, you know, the low level projections kind of business. And that's why I put him on here because we needed to a, a little example of it. I'm building up the suspense. The comp for Lazaro Montez is Mark McGuire minus the steroids hopefully um we're looking at 377 obp 40 home run that's not my projection that is scout the stat lines projection they love what lazaro montez let me see i'm pronouncing this lazaro montez doesn't help me on br but that's okay we're, we're going with it uh yeah he's just crushing what he's doing so far uh and, and as a teenager you know he came over from the dsl and he did pretty well over there and he did even better that's what you want to look for right he came over and he did better in the, in America in his pro debut. Uh, it's in 70 games, he gave us 13 home runs. And, you know, walks 54 times to 76 strikeouts for a 440 OBP. You know, he's just that. It's uh, everyone loves to say it, so we're gonna say it one more time. Baby, you're done. You're done. You know, Mr. Alvarez, whatever you want to say. Uh, he gets this comp because they're both huge guys from the same homeland and they train with the same guy and they're both just monster guys who can, who, who can get on base and have a decent approach and hit home runs. There's just one big difference. And that is Mr. Montez, Lozaro Montez. He's a teenager in a ball. So <laughs> we're going to have to have some patience here. Uh, he crushed it though. I mean, he just, you know, his, you know, his rookie and a ball appearances were just monstrous. He, he, he crushed the ball, 13 home runs total across both, uh, you know, both leagues in only 70 games. And, you know, he actually got better in a ball, a little bit better. So that's the kind of thing you love to see and coming from the DSL, especially when there's so many unknowns. He improved from the DSL to rookie ball, improved from rookie ball to a ball. Uh, we have a lot of reason to believe that there's something here, and and frankly, yeah, you don't see him on a, you see him on maybe like one uh, top 100 list here and there. I got him, I think, at 32, which show, you know that's ahead of Tyler Black and it's ahead of Jace Young, which I, I I just it's tough, but I think that's where you're gonna have to get him in dynasty startups. I think that's where you're gonna have to go for him because his name is getting out there. He's the flashy thing. There's just so much potential to them. You have to pay for the upside, knowing there is actually really high risk. You know, statistically, historically speaking, with these kind of guys, this young. I mean, you look at the comp STS has on him of Mark McGuire. It just gets you excited, you know. And again, it's it's pulling the data from the lower levels. So, of course, he's going to be propped up with a a much shinier comp. But 
think you said it perfectly when you're talking about what you're going to have to spend. You're going to have to spend a higher pick. You're going to have to give up more assets if you want to acquire Lazaro. So to finish your three here, if say you own Tyler Black and Jace Young, respectively, and, and an owner sends you an offer to Lazaro for individually one of these players, my guess would be that you're taking the deal and you're betting on the upside, or do you like the floor a little bit more of both uh, Tyler Black and Jace Young? This is a nice thing about having your own ranks. Uh, it's so fun. It's my first rank I've ever done. And I used to have to kind of click around to all these other ones and see whose ideas I like the best. And now I'm like, well, I got my own ideas here. And I took a while to you know, to figure them out. And so I have to just look at my ranks. And I'm like, yep, that makes sense with, with how I'm thinking on it. I have them in order, Montez, Black, and then Young. But they're you know, 32, 40, 49. So they're not crazy far off from each other. But yeah, I'd have to go with Montez just because, I mean, it seems like we have the OBP of Black and then even more power than Young. And that plays up. Um, we just got to hope that, you know, Seattle, they have all these young guys. Like, don't trade them to the Braves for, for a bag of peanuts. No offense <laughs> to this bag of peanuts, you know? Like, I don't know. Like, are they going to be in Seattle? I don't even know. But if anyone has the power to actually hit out of that pitcher's park, it's a guy like Montez. Yeah, I, I would agree with you fully, and I, I think that's the right answer, right? And, um, when I have to evaluate things, I reference my list as well, and and that usually comes into the equation when I have to maybe move things around because in the moment I'm thinking to myself, hey, I, I like Lazaro more than both of these players. If mm -hmm. in that moment I have Lazaro behind both of them, it's time to make some adjustments. And I'm, I'm jumping up and down if I get that offer in my inbox. It's a lot of excitement, but I loved your three names. I think all three have significant value in, in Dynasty Leagues as well as different profiles. And that's what we're looking for is really trying to build a team that has a great foundation where each individual is leveraging a skill set to build the overall collective if you're playing in Roto or you're playing in categories. So I have three names for you as well today, Doc. Uh, we have one that's a very exciting comp and one that we had a conversation about a little bit earlier with that exciting comp. So first name on my list is Matt Shaw another player that was in our FYPD this 2023 season. STS has him comped out as AJ Pollock, which I liked a lot. Uh, those of you that remember AJ Pollock when he was with the Diamondbacks, briefly with the Dodgers, very useful player until the injuries really kind of ended his career, got him off uh, kilter. But coming in with a 300 batting average, 27 home runs, 26 stolen bases for a peak projection for Matt Shaw. What do you think of the comp, and do you think it's realistic for him to ever hit this ceiling, which is pretty lofty? Yeah, so Pollock, it's do you know he's like he's still in the league? It doesn't even seem like he's still in the league. Is he is he signed right now? Is Since he like in the league on retired? Is that kind of the deal we're we're having with Pollock? Well, Pollock he played in twenty twenty three. Who was he with last year? He played with for Seattle and San Fran. I thought he was retired. So did I. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, I don't think it's going well. I think it's, 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 if he's, if I don't know if he's playing this year, to be honest, uh, it, it, judging by last year's stats, Hey, you had a great career buddy, but it's probably done. Yeah. I mean, you look at his, his peak season, a peak Pollock season, a 315 BA and 367 OBP. Uh, yeah, that's pretty good. You know, you're seeing, you know, he's in different kind of years, but his best season in terms of a fantasy season, I think you got to give it to his 20, 39 home run stolen bases kind of thing. And, uh, I'm not sure if that's exactly who Matt Shaw is, but I think it's a fun comp, and I think it's pretty close. I think it's pretty close to where he could get to in terms of upside. Uh, I think Shaw is an exciting young guy, you know, young talent, and it goes into our thing we were saying earlier: <laughs> who's the bust? Because I don't think yeah. it's him. Yep. What do you like the most about him? I think it's just the overall profile that we're looking at. Also, kind of the uncertainty of is is he a third baseman? Is he a second baseman? Because if we get Shaw at second base. There's a, there's a lot to like within the profile because you have the power numbers. Now, that obviously draws in question, okay, where does Nico Horner play? I think the most likelihood is Shaw is a third baseman, mm -hmm. right? Dansby Swanson signed on a long-term deal. Dansby Swanson's a gold glover. Like, he is the shortstop in Chicago. But that roster flexibility, if they end up playing Shaw around the infield where you can use him at a corner, maybe a middle infielder if he gets second and third, that flexibility for a player like this is huge. And I just overall love the fact that you're looking at a guy that's probably a 270 floor, probably 18 to 22 home runs floor, and then those 20 stolen bases, maybe 15 floor, but a ceiling as we're talking about here with the peak projection of 327 home runs, 26 stolen bases. That's an incredible middle infielder. 
and a guy with an FYPD that was outside of those top six. I, I love Shaw because stability is so key in building Roto and category teams. You need to have guys that help you take more risks. And Shaw's the perfect candidate for me at positions that, you know, once the top tier falls off, really drop. I think Shaw at even 2026, 2027 seasons could be a guy that we're talking about as a top five round pick. Yeah, I can see that. I, I can see that. And I mean, so here's the deal with it right now with Chicago land. He's, he's having a pretty solid spring training. I think he's actually having a better one than the numbers even suggest than the numbers suggest, because it's like he's hitting the ball so hard. Every time I see him and taking that bat, I'm trying to watch as many games as I can. And every time I see Matt Shaw taking that bat, he's smacking the heck out of that ball. And Christopher Morrell is at third base. And he's not that good at defense. And how much are they going to tolerate, uh, you know, these, these balls flying by him on, you know, on, on the, it's, just, it's not going to work out. Matt Shaw, I saw him make a great play the other day. It's just one play, but it's like he's already able to make that. I don't think Morrell makes that play ever or not. Yeah, I, don't, I honestly ever from the way it was a very impressive move. And so, yeah, I'm excited to see what we get from Matt Shaw. I think he's got, you know, he's got something where the scouts would call him. He's got a good face. <laughs> he's got a good baseball face. He's he very looks marketable. Almost, he, well, I mean, he just looks like a baseball player. It's so funny. And then you, if you, on your free time, listeners and Matt, look at Matt Shaw's face, and then look at Tyler, Tyler Black's face. These guys are the same. Are guy. they like twins? Is this yeah? They're, they're like like the same long guy. lost they're brothers. Almost, they're almost the same size too. It's kind of funny. Um, yeah. So Shaw, I mean, I can see him doing like a two seventy three forty kind of line dropping you 25 25 uh that's fun yeah yeah and again we have to see how it all plays out i want shaw to be given the time this year in the minor leagues to continue to develop to continue to to, you know harness that approach that he has the last takeaway on shaw out of the draft was playing at maryland maryland's fences are a little bit closer than other fields so when you look at his college and his collegiate numbers those home runs really stand out but this take was well hey those you know the fences are shorter. And it's like, well, we've seen right off the bat at pro ball, he's got the power. So, you know, the fences being shorter or not, like the Cubs drafted a really good player here. And anytime we're mm-hmm. talking about a 270, 340, 25, 25 guy, which you just alluded to, we got to get excited. And hey, again, someone's got to fail. You don't think it's going to be Shaw. I don't think it's going to be Shaw. So I think this is a really good player that you can build around, have some stability and lock into that third base spot as we start to see the Manny Machado's decline, as we start to see the uh, the Nolan Arenados and the Bregman start to phase out of this really big tier that we have at third mm-hmm. base. Shaw could be the guy filling and replacing some of those names at third base, which I think you're right. I think that's his ultimate home. Next name point. on the list. So Doc, you got him in the top 50. Um, I've got him a little more aggressive. We talked about him last week. It's James Wood. Um, and STS is very aggressive with this comp. So the algorithm is clearly projecting Hall of Fame status here. Uh, James Wood comps at Reggie Jackson, peak projection 252, 25 home runs, st- uh, 10 stolen bases. That's definitely not Reggie Jackson's peak projection. Uh, Reggie, mm-hmm. again, a Hall of Famer. But I think this is a really good peak floor for James Wood. The 250 is the number that really intrigues me because, as you said earlier, this is the X factor number. James has to do better than 252. You know, we've talked at length about him, but just give me your thoughts on a Reggie Jackson comp and his peak. I think the best part about the Reggie Jackson comp, if you ever take a look at his at his at his years, eventually, the, you know, the stolen bases kind of just drop off a cliff, and he still keeps hitting, and that's probably going to happen one day for James Wood. And the nice thing is he's a huge guy. So if the power keeps increasing while the speed's dropping, you're happy anyway. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if anyone's going to hold it over me for having James Wood at 48. It was before spring training, everyone. Uh, if I, if you told me that, you know, in your crystal ball, he would magically go from struggling immensely at double A to obliterating major league talent. It's like, yeah, that, that's surprising to me. So, yeah, uh, I think well, here's the big thing. I didn't do my ranks beforehand. Like, I didn't have other ranks. So if someone else had him in the top 20, and I remember being very excited before I did ranks. I was like, yeah, like, I hope he's doing really well in his first year. And then last year, you know, in double A, um, yeah, in double A, before double A, he was doing well. And in double A, he struggled. And I remember just feeling so disappointed and being like, oh, okay. I thought we had something, like, 
you know, something different here. And so maybe that's reflected in my ranks. But I even say in my analysis, I'm like, dude, if he keeps this up, I'm not going to be like, no, James, never James Wood. It's like, go on, buddy. The Nationals need you. They suck. So, yeah, man, go on. Be James Wood. Be, be your, you know, 30-30 guy if you got it in. Well, yeah, and I think when we look at Wood, the biggest thing that I'm looking for is a similar uh, trajectory that Ellie took. And when I say that, it's it takes a little time when you hit the, the big levels, double A, the triple A. How do you respond? How do you make adjustments? You can start off with a 35% K rate at double A, as James did. Does he come into this season and we really see a change in approach? Do we see him make those adjustments? And if we do, how does it then look at triple A? Right. As I mentioned earlier in the show, we still need to see what happens with Ellie. Can he make those adjustments at the major league level, pull that strikeout rate below 30? And if he does, we are talking about the mega star that we're all excited about. If he doesn't, you're going to have to really hope that speed and power is enough to overcome the strikeouts and the batting average. Similar questions for James Wood. I love him. You know, I think you need a little bit more to be sold on him, which is completely fair with those huge question marks we have. And Reggie Jackson, it's fun because we have similar body types, but also Reggie Jackson being known as one of the most prolific power hitters of his era and the excitement that Reggie brought. I like to see the similar excitement level for James Wood because that's, again, why I like fantasy baseball. It's why I watch baseball. It's for the big home runs, it's for the fast players. And I still, have... I don't want, I don't want, I don't want to see him end up the same way as Reggie Jackson though. You know, Reggie Jackson, remember Reggie Jackson where he started, he was going to go shoot the queen of England. Was he really? I'm pretty sure. So that was him in the movie, the smoking or the naked gun. He was in Naked Gun. He was in the I Naked need to Gun. Watch Naked Gun now. Watch the, the, you've never seen the Naked Gun. I, I may have, but if I've, I did, I didn't bring the reference point that Reggie Jackson was in Reggie it. Jackson, Naked Gun. Imagine it's not him. There was also it's not. Like, I'm not talking. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. he, uh, yeah. So he went to go shoot Queen Elizabeth. I'm not completely crazy, and I wasn't <laughs> thinking about OJ. OJ's the main guy, by the way. I know that. So, OJ's AJ's the OJ's the main sidekick to Leslie Nielsen. And then, do you want a little a little quick uh, one thirty yes, second? Yes, I do. Absolutely. Summary. Okay, because now we like, this half the re- half the listeners are like, dude, that's so funny. I get the reference, and the other half are like, oh, he's off his meds. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, here's the deal. Uh, the movie The Naked Gun is this slapstick Leslie Nielsen. If you never heard of him, look him up. He's funny, funny guy. It's just like every every other line's a pun. It's, it's, it's a classic. It's, it's really wacky. So you got him and he's this detective and he can never do anything wrong. And he's always doing everything wrong. And then there's this big plot and it all ends up and there's this baseball game uh, that they're at. I believe it's, it's the Dodgers. And, and he ends up becoming the umpire somehow. It's this whole ridiculous thing. Right. And he's just like, he's calling strikes. Yeah, he's getting into it. Leslie Nielsen. It turns out they've tapped into Reggie Jackson somehow and made him like this, like evil, robot like they've tur- they've tapped him and turned him into doing their bidding like zoolander and, almost yes a lot okay. like zoolander and then they go he goes over he pulls a gun out from like his i don't know somehow he had it on the field with him <laughs> i think and he uh, it's been a little while but he goes over to the queen of england and he's about to blast her and i think uh they st- no well i won't i'll leave it hanging for you i don't want to spoil the movie yeah he, he either Something is happens. successful or unsuccessful yeah. but Nielsen, yeah. I mean, I think the the biggest movie I know him from is Airplane, right? Okay, yeah. That, yeah. If, you've that... seen, if you've seen if you've seen Airplane, then yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's just basically a, just the same kind of idea. A genre of comedy because of the ability of him as a comedian and ability for him to act that was unique to not necessarily him because I think we've seen other actors play on similar roles of that goofy, stupid, stumbling, bumbling character, but he definitely did it well. And had it has a number of different movie titles that, like you just referenced, that are referenceable even to this day. Um, it is cool to so, see that Re- Reggie yeah. became an actor, though. I didn't know that. Well, I don't know if he was an actor. I think it was a one-off. But yeah, we don't want to see James Wood shooting the Queen of England. Yeah, That's not yeah, the trajectory we're talking not. about, people. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, and you know his profile. I I, me- I referenced Ellie earlier. We're going to talk about O'Neill here in a couple minutes. All three similar profiles: speed, tall, power, strikeout concerns. Right, like, but you get excited. I think when we talk about O'Neill, we'll mention some of those. But we have one more name to mention before we move on to our final segment, which will be spring training storylines. That last name is Thyron, uh, Thyron Lazar. Um, wow, I'm just going to butcher this. Thyron 
Well, Ronzo for the. LA. I thought it was Tyron. Is Am I Tyron? crazy? I think it's Tyron. Yeah, we got... We're gonna look this up, and this will probably be uh, <laughs> live on air, dude. They're yeah. not helping us. Well, and you we got had like this conversation. Ja on Smith. We had yeah. this conversation before we jumped on today. The pronunciation—it's never meant to be disrespectful. It's we're just two guys here that enjoy this, and we want to try to nail down these names as, as properly as possible. And it makes it, you know, they make it difficult at times, and we want to keep. That I don't have it for respect. you, buddy. You got you're, you're live on air, and you got to roll with what you well, think gonna, is best. I'm going to go with Iron uh, Lorenzo yes. for the Dodgers. This is a catching prospect. When you really look into him, first base might be an option. DH might be an option. He is a switch hitter. Put up really, really great numbers this season. Uh, STS has him comped out as Luke Voigt, which I think is a is a fair comp. Um, Lorenzo's at the the lower minors has put up power numbers, but we still haven't seen him against the tough pitching of double A or triple A. So peak projection being 40 home runs, he's ninth overall on STS rankings. And I think again, that's because of the lower level domination, but this is a player I'm also getting really excited about. And I'm trying to acquire because I want as many of these high upside guys as possible, knowing that they won't all play out. What do you think of um, Liz, uh, Lorenzo for the Dodgers. Oh, thank God, right? I mean, you just know the Dodgers needed him. <laughs> you just know that they didn't have enough <laughs> unbelievable catching talent. Looks like Cartaya is going through some struggles, so yeah. he's not coming through right now. Dalton Rushing is still there, and then Will Smith is like 29. Like, it's not like he's like going anywhere. So it's it's crazy. Uh, I'm in on Lorenzo. I'm all I'm. I'm I'm big on them. I can see here's a BR is great baseball reference. They have the other, they have some of the mainstream rankings up on their page. I see there's only one page that has, I'm going to shout them out. But baseball prospectus has them at the, as their number 70. So I'm still winning, but yep. uh, yeah, no, I, I like this guy, man. There's so much raw power, right? 94 games, 24 home runs, and a ball for a teenager. Uh, yeah. And he, so far the ratios are okay. They're, they're, they're actually pretty good, but, <clears throat> and he, and he and he did improve substantially on those ratios from rookie ball, which I love as well. That's something. Those are the things you want to see, right? When they're at the lower levels, are they improving? You know, they're improving substantially. That's kind of what happened with Samuel Bosayo too. You know, he was kind of doing these big improvements when he got promoted. It's like, well, okay, I'm gonna keep buying and keep buying, and now now he's top sixty. If he does this at high A and double A next year, it's like. This yeah, is the, the time the to get a explosion is about to happen. Yeah. If you're right, if yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, right now you can get him for almost nothing in yeah. comparison to where he could be. And uh, if there's ever a player that you can help us out with the pronunciation, please let us know on Twitter. I will probably be the uh, the victim of a lot of this, Doc. It's, uh, it's something that struggles I struggle with. I don't think there will be a single day over the next 10, 15 years of Colt uh, Keith's career that I don't accidentally call him Colt Heath. So whether it's a little dyslexia or it's just because of my lack of, uh, my lack of intel intelligence, please never feel – as a listener, like you can't let us know because again, the objective is to be as respectful as possible and talk about these guys with proper names. So please let me know. Um, and I, I share the same sentiment you did about him. I, I think the power is there. I think he's a really fun guy to watch. Absolutely. Any of these guys coming out of, uh, you know, the lower levels, whether it's a or high, a could always fizzle out, but you know, these are the names throughout the minor league season that we want to get excited about. And he's definitely a player that fits that profile for us. But, Doc, we are on to our final segment. We're going to talk a little bit about spring training. So we've got a couple really interesting storylines to talk about. I want to start off with Marte. Marte suspended 80 games. That's Noel V. Marte for the Reds. Big, you know, conversations going on on Twitter this week about, you know, where should he fall now? Was his performance and his body changed because of steroids? I think you and I fall in, in line with what actually happened. But what are you projecting for him when he comes back? <clears throat> And does he move it all in the rankings because of the suspension? Oh, I mean, uh, well, first of all, the people who are affected most by this is, is well, it's just, I mean, it's my TGFBI league. It's me. Oh, no. I picked him. I got a great value, even though it's my only league I had him in anyway. <laughs> so, you know, everyone's first thought. Now, I mean, here's the thing. Uh, I, I don't think it moves him in my rank. It would move him probably, if I had to do it today, it might move him a little bit, just a little bit. But only because of proximity, because now he is not. He, he went from opening day locked in guy pretty much to we're not seeing him till June, you know. And who knows how things are going? If everyone's grooving and jiving, uh, maybe there's maybe he's the odd man out now. Whereas that would make no sense before. 
Uh, but that said, his numbers, you know, his numbers are, they're kind of the same-ish all the way going up through his minors. I, I still see 20 home runs, 30 stolen base upside. Uh, you know, I was talking with Ross about this on Twitter. I, I, hey, I, I love Ross. He'll defend his take, I'll defend my takes. And I, I don't, I agree with Ross. I don't think that 316 BA was necessarily was sustainable i don't think it was sustainable i think 366 obp probably not sustainable but i do think there is like a 270 350 kind of guy in here maybe 340 i don't know but it doesn't really matter as long as it's serviceable and you're getting to 20 home runs 30 stolen bases so no for me he's the same kind of guy uh it just sucks because it's delayed now and he's losing that momentum how about you does this affect your your opinion on him and then i guess maybe if you, if you could shift into uh, how does that affect the reds infield yeah, and I think that's the biggest point for me is there were question marks coming into the season as as what the Reds did this year. They signed Jamer Candelario, you know, which I love in the ballpark, but the question was how do you get all these pieces from Ellie, Matt McLean, CES, you know, LV Marte and Jonathan India all to play when Jamer's also in, in the fold. And I think it was gonna affect each and every player, probably outside of Ellie, until Ellie started to struggle and then it really may have affected Ellie. Those question marks may have been a little bit pulled back now, right? Because now Jamer can play. You probably have Ellie solidified at the shortstop. Um, McLean probably fills in at second, short, third, depending on off days. CES can now play DH or first base. And it really allows this to kind of happen naturally. He's not dropping in my rankings, but I think the biggest thing to follow is what happens if every single one of these guys plays well leading up to June. Now, now if he comes back from the suspension, it's like, well, who do we who do we swap him out for? We can't. Now, I know they'll make it work, and I know he'll play, but trades are also still on the table. You know, India's news has been floating it around for over a year now in regards to possibly him being moved. But I'm excited for the rest of these guys to really solidify their role, eat for the, for better or worse, right? Who is the guy that may fall out of the um, the favor of the Reds, and what do they do with him? And I think with what we saw with Noel V, the organization itself can have confidence with him coming back that he should still be a starter level player, if not a plus player at the major league level. Because again, I'm not projecting him to be a guy that's been using for a number of years. Mm -hmm. We got Tatis who got popped a couple of years ago. It was kind of obvious that he was using to get back from injuries, you know, and I, I think he got a really harsh rap for, for the, the steroid pop, but that is what it is in today's game. Um, Interesting storyline. I did not obviously expect for this to ever be news. No. And but it makes sense. You know, there well, the was nice, an injury. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the nice thing is that the manager I forget his name right now, my goodness, what a loser. Uh but the manager the Cincinnati manager, uh he 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 immediately came out and said, Hey, you know, we've you know, we've got it we've got his back and and when he's back we're was water under the bridge i don't know if it's necessarily water under the bridge but it's like we're gonna move on yeah um and so yeah we are going to we're gonna see how they go from there hey flip side for you with Marte, real quick you know of course yeah everyone could gel and there could be you know there could be no room for him or they could be struggles there could be injuries yeah. and it's like man this guy just yeah he, he got back from injury and now he's got more rest than he ever asked for he's gonna be coming in fresh off the bench he's gonna be a it could be an injection of life and have a great second half. That's the beauty of baseball. You never know. Yeah. We have in the likelihood of all of these players actually hitting peak this season, right. Is, is probably unlikely. So that's definitely a storyline we will be following up until that 80 game suspension is done and how everything shakes out with this infield as well as the reds, as they're coming into a season where they should be in all sense and purposes, competing for an NL central title, if not a wild card spot. But we have another big storyline and news today. A.J. smith Shaver being pushed down to Major League Camp. He was in competition for that brave sp uh, fifth spot in the rotation with Elder and Ronaldo Lopez. Personally, Doc, I think this is great for A.J. smith Shaver. I want to see more development. I want to see him come up and stick in the rotation when he is finally ready. What do you think about this, you know, this demotion that we're labeling it? Ah, yeah. I mean, I don't know. He, he came up probably too fast last year, so I think it's fine. I think he'll still be up pretty early. The Braves, they they're a smart organization. They make their moves when they need to. You know, if if he's ready, he'll be there. And yep. if there's guys ahead of him struggling, they're not going to just keep them in there for the sake of keeping them in there. Well, I think too, kind of as you mentioned with Marte, 
AJ Smith Shaver comes up in June, May, maybe it's July. That's a that's a deadline acquisition. We've seen him had have success at the major league level, maybe not as much success as we would have liked, but he was so young. This could be a really big boost for this Braves um, rotation or bullpen. You know, we talk about another guy here, Hurston Waldrip, who is another mm -hmm. FYPD guy. He's another name that could be interjecting a lot of life and ability and talent into the Braves midseason if he produces. Uh, you could have two names here. Maybe just one of them come up and provide value, but looking to add pieces as the season goes on. And I think this also adds uh, a drop in ADP for AJ smith Shaver in redraft leagues because you're going to be projecting him down the line. And I think it's a name that we've seen, again, have success. So maybe he's the last guy on your bench and you're waiting it out, but it could be three weeks from now. I think you mentioned that before we jumped on today. Who knows when he comes up? There could be an injury yeah. tomorrow. Mm-hmm. All right, we got one last really big news and notes, and this was one I, I know you wanted to talk about. It's coming from the Baltimore organization. Jackson Holiday, Kobe Mayo playing very, very well this spring, looking like they are ready for a major league opportunity. What are you hearing around the league, and what have you seen so far this spring from both players? Well, they both seem to be pretty good at baseball. <laughs> that uh, helps. Yeah, so Kobe Mayo. You know, I'm going to keep tooting my own horn here. I have a seven overall prospect. And, and frankly, you know, he was kind of flying under the radar. We were talking before the podcast started, and I was saying, man, it seems like you, you have to not only – you have to hit home runs, and they have to be televised home runs because the spring training, some guys just they're not on TV, even if they're doing well. So the, all the spring training all the spring training helium goes to this, these guys who are ripping bombs on TV. And I said, uh, you know, he had, a, he had a nice double on TV the other day, and it was going around. I said, hey, everyone, just a heads up. Like, he's doing great. Like, he's, his ratios are here. He's, he's smacking the ball really hard just because he doesn't have a home run yet. That's the one thing we know he's going to hit. He's 6'5", 230. He's got a huge power bat. We know that Kobe Mayo is going to bring the heat with that bat. And then five seconds later, <sighs> crush one into the parking lot. So, yeah, and then just right – I mean, that day, Kobe Mayo, the helium started just going – you could just feel it, and it's, and it's already being seen in, in ADPs. And uh, and I picked him as my Marte fill in and TGFBI. It's okay, like just nice. before that all happened. So you nice. know, I mean, uh, yeah, things worked out great. Then obviously Jackson Holiday is Jackson Holiday. Uh, it's interesting. He's hitting the ball harder than maybe we thought he would, which is just so exciting because I personally, I'm like, he's going to get on base. He's going to have a nice batting average, which is kind of rare for a young guy uh, to have that expectation. And he's going to steal bases and get runs and just do. He's going to be a good ball player in a great lineup. Well, now he's showing some power. I don't know. I honestly don't even know what his upside is, is this year. I don't think it's White Lankford, but I think he's making the opening day roster. I think you look at the guys who are on the 40 man, man, no disrespect to Ryan O'Hearn or, or Hayes or Urias, these guys. It's like, man, you got to find a way if you're serious about being a championship baseball team. The kids are ready. Yeah, and new ownership. So, you know, when we had this conversation throughout the last year within the, the fantasy baseball community, the baseball community, it was, well, are there, is there going to be roster manipulation? Do they really care about potentially winning a draft pick if Jackson Holiday can win rookie of the year? Uh, it, those conversations have changed because you have a new regime. And I think you just give yourself, you know, 2x the opportunity if you bring both of these kids up right away and let them play in the opening day lineup for that draft pick compensation. You have Mayo ready to go, as, as we're seeing right now. Holiday also. My projection for Holiday this year was that probably makes the opening day lineup. Um, you know, Probably starts to kind of come into his own end of June, maybe July. Really starts to find a little bit more power as the season goes on. I could be completely wrong. He might be able to, to jump into that role middle of April. I mean, the kid at every single level just seems to click and dominate sooner than I ever expected him to. Obviously, having the bloodline helps, having his father be an all-star himself and, and be able to coach him through some of those tendency changes, those uh, shifts as pitchers are, are approaching him differently will will always aid him. But dude, the, the, the talent just jumps off the page. Watching him against Zach Wheeler last week, seeing the grand slam against uh, the Blue Jays just a couple days ago, that was a deep home run. That was mm -hmm. big-time power for a kid that is still developing into his body. 
it's exciting and you know i i, I kind of see the way he's developing and i'm like dude, he's, i could see him get more matt holiday like where mm-hmm. you know this, maybe we're looking more we flip it around from like 20 30 to like a 30 20 one day not right now but in terms of yeah i mean his body could just shift completely and, may, and i think maybe we'd be fine with that you know? yeah especially coming from he's a second baseman now which for fantasy it's almost being overlooked uh it's like it's better that there's not as much at the second base so yeah let's well, go jackson holiday and some of the power profiles that we've talked about just today alone right james wood uh lazaro montez you know, we've met, i've mentioned ellie's name we're going to talk about one more name we have to finish off the show today but a lot of strikeout concerns jackson doesn't have that he obviously mm-hmm. doesn't have this big prodigious power yet we're starting to see flashes of nice power but he's a contact first guy at every single level and if power really is the last skill for some of these players to develop, we could be talking about truly a generational player as Jackson's peak projection by a lot of different publications has showcasing. And there's a lot to be excited about. I think redraft leagues, we're going to start seeing both Mayo and Jackson's names start to climb the rankings kind of leads us into the last name of the day, which is O'Neill Cruz coming off the leg injury that we saw last year in April. We didn't get to see the 2023 play out and have some of the questions answered that we were really looking for with O'Neill Cruz. The big one being his splits, righty lefties. He plays very well against righties. Lefties is a different storyline. So 2024, we're seeing a discount in him in ADP, but just this week, two home runs, monster exit velocities. One was at 118. I think your take on this is going to be right in line with mine. So what are your thoughts on O'Neill Cruz as we stand today? Oh, I think He's got. He's very. He's, he has an intolerance problem. He just can't stand the sight of baseballs, and when he sees them, he needs to get them as far away from him as possible. <laughs> uh, I need some sensitivity training or something, man, because it's disrespectful. One sixteen mile per hour. One fourteen mile per hour. Expo, one sixteen. Expo. Okay. Yeah, yeah. One sixteen was the top one point something, and uh, yeah, he's just smacking the heck out of these balls. It's like, well, is he is he still getting the rust off? Is he still warming up? Is it? Or do we have? more to go here i don't know man he's still pretty young he hasn't even logged a full season in the bigs yet it's very exciting and you know he seems to be having a bit more i did some research on him because uh he was and i'm gonna pump it again tgfbi i got him baby he fell to me and i was like what's wrong like, like am i crazy is this is this too risky like this year because he's coming off a you know, messed up leg is he still gonna run so yeah. i talked to some to some guys i know who follow the, the, the you know pittsburgh pretty t- pretty closely I said, is he still going to run? He said, yep, yeah. without hesitation. He said, yep. Yeah. Um, and I'm looking into it. He's They're saying the same things. But he, I don't know if you remember this, but O'Neill Cruz had this kind of cocky line when he was coming out last year. He said, I'm going for 40-40. You know, that's 30-30s whatever. I'm going for 40-40. Like the LeBron thing. I'm going in seven rings. You know, I was like, <laughs> okay, dude. How about just one? It'd be great for now. Um, how about a full season? And so O'Neill Cruz, they came out and the way he's talking. It's like the... He's like, I'm just here to put in the work, and I think we're going to have a great season. Just, you know, go through, we'll see what happens next. And I think it's funny. I think having a Paul Skeens on there, who's just this military Air Force kind of background, will be very interesting. And Henry, Henry Davis has some kind of an intensity to him, too, you know, focusing on the job. I think this is good. I think this is good for O'Neill Cruz. He's not going to get to, you know, it's cool to have fun, but I think he's going to be, instead of thinking about these fun numbers, it's like, do your job. Yeah. Hopefully that hopefully that's what we see from O'Neill Cruz because if O'Neill Cruz does his job, fantasy GMs are gonna love what they see. Did you get a chance to watch either of those home runs? Yes. Okay. The, you know the biggest takeaway, and this kind of goes into the premise of everything we talk about. You know, the foundation of the show is when I watched him hit that one sixteen, it didn't look like he put anything into it. Mm-hmm. It was a flick. I mean, and it exploded off his his bat, and it reminded me of the 2022 numbers and some of the hits he had where you kind of just scratched your head and you're like, how can he possibly hit the ball the way he is? When we see Giancarlo put up those numbers, you know, you understand because it's an extreme bat whip. He is an incredibly built guy. But O'Neill Cruz is, is just leveraging his body and his height to produce these mm-hmm. incredible exit velocities, and he hasn't even tapped into his peak yet. And, and I think that's what's so exciting for me, at least. Yeah, absolutely. I always think about the Jake DeGrom. Do you remember this one? He had a DeGrom through, I think a, I think it was a filthy curve, and it was going down. I believe it was way outside of the zone. And Cruz just went down and got it and just 
golfed it up and out. See, so, yeah, like one of the best well, pitchers in the game, if not if not the best while he's yeah. healthy, and just said see you later. And again, it looks so easy, which is just what's gonna what's the ceiling on this kid? Because yeah. he's starting to take more walks, and he was starting to do it at the beginning of last season too. And so if that's a thing, if there's any kind of approach improvement here, where he starts looking for a pitch. Yeah, and really builds, uh, like you said, builds the approach, really starts to hone in on one. What's yeah, he's got a four. Him. Yeah, sorry to cut you off, but I'm just, I mean, I'm looking at spring numbers. I, like, you, you know, we're just thinking about these bombs, which he has three of them now. He's got a 409 OBP, uh, you know, to a 278 average. And I'm like, that kind of, that's not going to happen, I don't think. But it's like, that's very interesting. It's it's not like he's doing the 278, you know, it's, it's not like he's doing the 320, 333. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not like he's just yeah. like, mostly contact or just you know swinging and miss all the time that's something there even doesn't even almost doesn't matter what the numbers are the fact that there's like you know a over 100 point gap between the two and like there's a substantial like you know he's taking walks i'm excited it's just exciting yeah he's an exciting player and i think there was a lot of value there in redraft leagues this year as well as dynasty because of the injury and i think the the biggest storyline that i will be following is his his splits this season in 2024 and can he keep that patience? Can he keep an approach against lefties? Honestly, when you have the skill set that O'Neill has, I don't necessarily ever need him to hit 280 against a lefty. If he can hit 220, 230 with a great OBP where he's taking walks against lefties because they are constantly challenging him and that might be a hole in his game and he leverages that great split against righties, he's still an absolute dominant fantasy player and it's just about him developing into his, his overall major league form this hopefully is the season that we get to see him play 140, 150 games, because I think at 140, 150 games, your return on investment in TGFBI is going to be massive. I mean, you're going to have one of the best shortstops, and you didn't have to necessarily pay for him because of the injury and the concern. So this is probably my most exciting player that is on a major league team for sure, locked in, maybe outside of Ellie. You know, they happen to have the same last names, happen to have similar profiles. Uh, I think one of them will absolutely be successful this year. And if we can get both of them to be successful, that NL Central is just going to be so fun to watch. I'm excited. It's a great time for baseball. These you know, these, these rules are one of the best things baseball's done lately. I think specifically the stolen bases and then, you know, these the incentives to bring the young guys up faster. Yeah, it's great because it's just so good for the big. For, for, it's so good for the game. Why why not have an extra year? What if you know there's a there's a chance in the past. And we wouldn't have seen Gunner and Corbin Carroll and all the fun stuff we saw last year. So, yeah, it's a great time, man, and I'm excited. I think you better go get O'Neill Cruz right now if you want him because I'm already seeing him go faster in, in drafts since he started cracking bombs. Yeah, that ADP is, is definitely going to start climbing as we get closer and as those home runs continue to hit Twitter. Um, you said it best, the highlights sell, right? That's just that's spring training hype. But – that's all we have for you today. Uh, Doc, before I say goodbye, is there anything else that you wanted to to toss in? Uh, I mean, give us a five-star rating. Tell people to listen to our podcast. There's so many of them these days, but ours is the best, obviously, because you made it to the end, so you, you believe that and you know this to be true. So, yeah, no, just keep on paying attention. Follow us on Twitter. I'm at Doc Holiday Dinah. We got uh, Matt at Matt underscore E underscore Morris. I think I got that correctly. Yep. And, uh, yeah, man, we're going to be coming at you with all kinds of content every Sunday. I'll be dropping my Sunday smoke. And I think we're dropping this on a Tuesday from now on, but we'll see about that. Yeah, and, uh, you know, as you said, Doc, there's a lot of different podcasts out there. We, we're going to do the best we can to, to be a little different, be a little more engaging, be a little fun. And uh, just follow along with us every single week. We're on all the podcast platforms, Apple, Spotify. Uh, Google, not that I use Google. There's a lot of them out there. And and interesting talking to people on what they actually listen through. Uh, It was kind of surprising. So Mm -hmm. follow along with us. Uh, And and as Doc said, a lot of our content will be on scoutthestatline.com. Doc is very, very active on Twitter. I am not as much so. Hope to change that this season. But uh, again, look for us every single Tuesday as we drop episodes and continue to keep you uh, up on the news and, and track some of our favorite players as the 2024 season gets ready to kick off. But We will see all of you guys next week. Thank you. 